Hello, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the eighth webinar of our knowledge building series on reclaiming Adl and Ihsan in Muslim marriages between ethics and law. Thank you for joining us from all over the world. We're honored by your presence. This is really what makes our conversation so rich, and we appreciate your questions and reflections shared throughout our last webinars. My name is Sarah Marso. I'm the coordinator of Musawa's Knowledge Building Working Group, and I will be the housekeeper for today's event. The previous webinars looked at marriage from a fiqh, historical and legal perspective. Our last webinar featured Amira Abu Talib and Faiza Vaid, who shared with us some fascinating findings on the ethical concept of Ihsan in the Quran and how it builds on Adl, on justice, with family as the founding block from which Ihsan radiates to the world. If you missed this webinar or the previous ones, you can watch all the recordings in Musawa's YouTube channel. But today we have the honor to continue this conversation on Quranic ethics in marriage with four groundbreaking scholars and pioneers in the field of Islamic studies and feminist studies. Dr. Ziba Mir Husseini, Dr. Umayma Abu Bakr, Dr. Asma Al-Murabit and Dr. Mulki Al-Sharman. They will take us through a journey exploring the Quran's teachings on marriage from an ethically oriented reading and what does that tell us about the link between Quranic ethics and Islamic legal tradition. Because of the complexity of this topic, this webinar will be exceptionally longer as we have allocated an extra 20 minutes in the end to give more space for discussion. And before I hand over to Dr. Ziba Mir Husseini, who would be the moderator for this session, I have a few housekeeping items to share with you. The webinar is also being live streamed by our Facebook page and will be available later on our YouTube channel. Participants who are joining us on Zoom will be able to ask questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. If you don't get to your question during today's webinar, please don't hesitate to follow up with us via the email that is on the screen now. Please use the chat function if you're experiencing any technical difficulties and I will be there to assist you. And in the chat box, I will be also sharing some resources or any reference material that the speakers uh, speak to. If you are tweeting or posting about this webinar, please don't hesitate to tag us at Musawa on Twitter and at Musawa Movement on Facebook and Instagram. Now let me introduce you to our moderator, Dr. Ziba Mir Husseini, my teacher and also feminist mentor. And I'm sure many of you already know her and her groundbreaking work. She is a legal anthropologist specializing in Islamic law, gender and development. She has a BA in sociology from Tehran University and a PhD in social anthropology from the University of Cambridge. Currently, she's a professional research associate at the Center for Middle Eastern and Islamic Law at the University of London and has held numerous research fellowships. She authored many fundamental publications, which you can all find in her website and also in Musawa's website in the full bio. She co-directed with Kim Langinotto two award-winning feature-length documentary films on Iran, uh, such as Divorce, Iranian Style, and Runaway. And in 2015, she received the American Academy of Religions Martin E. Marty Award for the Public Understanding of Religion. But the most important thing, Ziba is one of the co-founders of Musawa and leading our knowledge building uh, team. So we're very privileged to have with us uh, Ziba here to moderate this discussion, which promises to be memorable. Thank you. And I'm going now to hand over the webinar to you, Ziba Jan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah, for this nice introduction. And I also extend a very warm welcome to everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Let me start um, uh, with the opening paragraph of an article by Nasr Abu Zaid, which is entitled The Status of Women between the Quran and Fiqh. This article is published now. I quote, in a brilliant remark, the Egyptian reformist Muhammad Abdu compares the jurist definition of marriage with the Quran's view of marriage relationship. Marriage, according to Fiqh, is a contract which renders the female vagina the property of a male. The Quran's view, however, is that marriage is one of the divine signs, ayat. And here, uh, Abu, uh, Nasr Abu Zed refers to the Quranic verse 3021. And I continue, this is again called from Abu Zed. 
that Abdul emphasizes the responsibility of fiqh for downgrading women's status from the high level it has in the Quran. This article was in fact the last writing before Abu Zayd's untimely death in 2013. He presented it in January 2010 in a workshop on gender and equality in Muslim family law as part of the Oslo Coalition Research Project, New Directions in Islamic Thought. Musawa then was uh, oh, less than one year old, in fact. And we also held a planning meeting for our first project back to back with the Oslo project in Cairo. And our first project examined Qawama and Velaya, two central juristic concepts, which as understood, translated into legal rulings by our fact tradition, place women under male authority. And in fact, they lie at the very heart of unequal construction of gender rights in Muslim family roles. What we tried to do in that project was to understand why, and also to produce new feminist knowledge that critically engages with these legal concepts and redefines them in line with the contemporary notion of justice. Of course, they understood it in their own context, and we wanted to understand the verse and these two concepts in our own context. This, of course, took us to, ver uh, to famous verse 434, that is from which the term qawama is derived. And it is always invoked to justify inequality in Islamic law. And in fact, I would say it is the only verse that many Muslims know in, religion, in relation to family and marriage. And um, it is a verse that uh, is at the center of contestation. See, uh, now, and in fact, I can say since the early 20th century and late 19th century. There is now a wide literature on this verse. And what this literature shows us more than anything is that this verse presents Muslim with difficulty, with a dilemma how to understand it. So we engage with this verse. And our um, project had two elements. One element was the theoretical papers understanding uh, the creation or, or of Qawama and Velaya and their construction in Muslim legal tradition. And the second element was to explore the working of these two concepts in the everyday life of men and women. And for this, we work with our advocates in different contexts and we collected life stories. Uh, the outcome of this um, uh, first pro uh, project are two books, Men in Charge, Rethinking, Men in Charge, of course, with the question uh, mark, Rethinking um, Authority in Male Tradition. And I was one of the editors with Mulki Al Shamrani and Jana Raminger. So that was one of our main uh, products in Musaba. And the second one was the women's life and women's stories. And women's life and stories is based on the life stories. And this is a project that Mulki actually uh, supervised and coordinated very closely. And Sara also joined us during this phase. Uh, now we are working on a new project, which we started in 2000. 19. And as you know, it is entitled Reclaiming Adl and Ihsan in Muslim Marriages. What we want to do in this, this new project is to build and promote an understanding of marriage as partnerships of equal. Through studies engaging with Islamic textual tradition and history, contemporary Muslim family laws, human rights standards, and most of all, lived realities and diverse context. 
So this project has another empirical side that we have not been able to start because of COVID, but we're very much hoping to initiate it in this uh, year uh, 2021. The questions that we are asking in that project is how in this new project is that how can the patriarchal ethics and principles that have informed Muslim marriages as articulated in classical fair rulings be retold, reconstructed in line with contemporary notion justice to which gender equality has become inherent in the course of the 20th century? The second uh, question, uh, these are big questions that I'm putting forward, is what, are, what other ethical and normative frameworks can also inform Muslim marriages and how do they relate to Quranic ethics? Muslim legal tradition, modern state laws and Muslim co uh, communities and international human rights, because we have different um, we live in a uh, world that it is plural and the law that is produced and the knowledge that is produced is plural. And how do all these relate to the lived realities and Muslim men and women? The three panelists who are with us now were with us in the first project. And uh, all three contributed to the book and in fact, um, they were, um, Omaima and Molki was with us Omaima in the both um, uh, workshop in 2010 and Morky in one of them from the outset. And um, our third pan panelist, Asma, joined us during the Kawama project. So what uh, this, pro I will introduce this um, uh, panelist, but I want also to say something about women interpreting the Quran. Until recently, interpreting and understanding the Quran, the field of tafsir was like other branches of Muslim sciences, the monopoly of the ulama, all men, and an elite class of religious scholars who viewed themselves and were regarded as custodians of the knowledge. In the early um, centuries of Islam, there were of course women who read and interpreted the Quran, but there is almost no trace of their understanding, their voices in the field of tafsir or Quranic studies. The records of, of their endeavors need to be recovered. And that is the task of Muslim feminists. In more recent time, we have notable women adding their voices. Women like Aisha Taymour, who died in 1902, so her life is in 19th century. Then in 20th century, we have Aisha Abdul Rahman and uh, Nazira Zainuddin. There are others. But I can say that the critical mass of women interpreters did not emerge until the last decade of the 20th century. And there is now a considerable body of literature on women reading Quran. And what this literature has in common and what it shows us is that the Quran affirms the full humanity of women and the principles of equality for all, for all human beings. And um, among the pioneers of this um, uh, women reading the Quran are women like Amina Vadud, Aziza Al Hibri, Fatima Mernisi, Asma Ballas, and Nemat Barzangi. There are many others, but there is the, what I want to emphasize that there is there now we have many women interpreters, and I only mention those that published in English. What they are doing is they are expanding the boundaries of Islamic tradition, our understanding of our tradition. And in Musawa, we aim to build on their work. And it is here that we have three panelists with, with them. And I'm, I'm really, really honored to be able to introduce them by, one by one. And each of them have been part of the struggle and the journey that we have. 
The first um, panelist is Omeima Abu Bakr. Professor Abu Bakr, uh, Omeima is a professor of English and comparative uh, literature in Cairo University. She is also the founding member of the Women and Memory Forum and a member of the Musawa knowledge building team. She specializes in Sufi medieval poetry and comparative topics in medieval literature, uh, uh, English literature and Arabic. She has wide um, uh, literature uh, publication that I won't mention that, but her work is amazing. And her chapter in Men in Charge was one of the chapters that we read. When we read, we said, aha, things will came clear. And our second panelist is Dr. Asma Lamrabit. Asma Lamrabit among us is the real doctor. She is a medical doctor at the Avicenna um, uh, Public Hospital in Rabat. Asma was the director of the Center for Women's Studies in Islam in Rabat and Mohammedia of the Ulama in uh, Morocco between 2010 and 2018. And in fact, that center has been the first center of women's studies within a religious institution, which is very important. Asma is also a writer and has many books and, and also uh, many lectures. She is a public figure as well. And she is um, the founding member of Fatima Mernisi chair of uh, chair at Muhammad Fifth University of Rabat, which was established in 2015, and a member of Morocco National Committee on uh, Culture and uh, Education. So you see, she is both a doctor and a mufassir, as well as a public figure. And our uh, third panelist is my dear colleague, Dr. Mosley, uh, Mulki Al Shamrani. Mulki is Associate Professor of Islamic and Middle Eastern Studies of Helsinki University. And of course, she is a member of uh, Musawa Knowledge Building Group. Mulki has a number of articles and a number of edited books. And um, uh, she's also the author of, a, a, I would call it groundbreaking uh, book, which is based on field research in uh, Cairo and also in court on gender justice and legal reform in um, uh, Egypt, negotiating Muslim family laws. And of, uh, more than anything, Mos Murki is the um, uh, co-editor of Men in Charge, one of the important books. Now, I, I'm, I must thank all you three for joining us here and uh, for doing this incredibly in, important work. My first question is that, what brings you individually to this project? And how do you three work together? And where do you come from? What is your standpoint? I ask this because it is important because we approach the Quran always from a position, from a pretext, from a context. So I want each of you to introduce yourself. Shall we start with Omeima? Yes, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, assalamu alaikum, shukran. Thank you Ziba for a great introduction. Thank you Musawa and Sara and all friends here. Um, what's my standpoint, um, you know, the, this special, a special relationship with the Quran. Uh, you know, the Quran is, is the ultimate source of, of everything for in, in our lives. Uh, the doctrine, the religion, the spirituality, the ethics. It is something that, you know, you read, you recite, you pray by, you live by. Uh, and, and more importantly, with, with the three of us in uh, coming together in this uh, project, is looking and reflecting upon the Quran also for ourselves as women, as Muslim, for ourselves and by ourselves, right? The, um, the feeling that the Quran is not for men, 
right, alone, <laughs> as the women companions of the Prophet والسلام, often, you know, went to him and wondered if, if the Quran all, all, uh, only addresses the men. Uh, so the Quran is, is ours too, as Muslim believers, as Muslim believing women. And uh, we all have this special uh, connection with the Quran, and we all have the same struggles and the same uh, uh, reflections upon it. Uh, working together has been and is still a joy, really, uh, uh, Mulki and Asma, spiritually and intellectually. It's been a joy and very inspirational. Um, and I think we're all on the same wavelength. It's, and it's, it's true as the cliche goes that we finish each other's sentences. It's, it's so true uh, when we have our meetings and our sessions together, looking at the verses and the surahs and the discussing stuff. Uh, um, you know, Asma will, will come with a thought, Mulki will come with a thought, and then we'll say, yes, 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 exactly. Uh, and then, oh no, remember, there's this verse, right? Uh, but then remember, there's also this exegete who said about this verse so and so, and and really, and it's it's amazing. We just think together, reflect together, and also feel together. And sometimes, uh, uh, you know, we're overwhelmed by the beauty of of a, of a particular thought or the beauty of a Quranic uh, idea or a verse. Uh, but then. We're also together in this um, intermediate uh, space, <laughs> which is not always comfortable or causes sometimes discomfort because it's vague. It lacks a label, at least from people looking upon us. How, how do we put a label on, 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 on these people? <laughs> and we are in this intermediate uh, uh, space between you know a place that can be completely dismissive of, of, of religion as incompatible uh, with feminism with truly emancipatory uh, you know experience or as naive maybe religious faith as naive and belonging mm -hmm. to another you know supernatural consciousness so that that's one place and then there's the other place that can be also, patriarchal uh, uh, dismissiveness of, of women's experience and women's discomfort and women's queries about sacred uh, uh, texts, uh, or a patriarchal, again, monopoly of religious knowledge or patriarchal dismissiveness of feminist mm -hmm. consciousness altogether. So we're in between. Another intermediate, uh, uncomfortable uh, also position is, again, between a, a position that would attack the tradition, the interpretive tradition of, of Islam completely, right? And, and dismiss it completely, uh, tear it down, uh, or a position that would glorify it as infallible, as, as, you know, or shying away from calling it patriarchal, which it is, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we're in that position, but we're together. So we don't feel apologetic about sure about saying that we are in this uh, ambivalent uh, you know position and we express our discomfort together and we're not uh, 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 we admit we're confused sometimes right mm. asma what about you you are mute asma So, <clears throat> Bismillah and uh, salam to all of you. Uh, thanks, Ziba, for your words. Thanks uh, to Musawa for uh, organizing this uh, such, you know, interesting and very, very necessary webinar. Uh, what brings me to this project is the same feeling, you know, uh, as Omeyba said. But uh, it, it's, um, you know, it starts for me uh, 20 years ago now. When um, when I, uh, I I call it at that time, you know, a need for a third way, uh, a third way between these two uh, ideologic, uh, ideological vision, you know, between uh, the traditionalist patriarchal and conservative way, 
And the other way, uh, you know, the, the secular or modernist, too much modernist in the sense that uh, um, they told us uh, as a Muslim uh, woman to, uh, uh, to be without spiritual roots or to uh, put aside uh, our faith and our beliefs. So um, this project means a lot for me, you know, because I see it as a continuation of our previous work, but uh, which is now reaching, uh, I, I think that uh, Mulki and uh, Omeima are agree, will agree, because it's now reaching a certain maturity. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, is it like if this quest for justice and equality that we were so much looking for is today stronger and more possible, you know, uh, than ever with this project? Uh, I really can't uh, uh, describe how uh, are my feelings, you know, working with these two uh, wonderful women. It's just like uh, uh, Umeima uh, uh, said, it. it's just like we, if we, uh, each of us is completing the other, and uh, we share the same passion, the same doubts, the same fears, <laughs> the same feeling uh, and understanding of, uh, of the sacred text. And um, something very important, fundamental for me, the love for the Quran. So I think uh, that's also what we share mostly is a mutual you know, intellectual respect and the uh, spiritual curiosity also very very uh, deep and uh, uh, a kind of uh, serenity approaching the text now uh, i think that uh, even if our position like you say uh, omeima is very uh, is not that comfortable you know it's very uncomfortable because we are in the, the course of different approach we assume that uh, our approach is academic is uh, spiritual is feminist but we are respectful uh, toward the tradition but at the same time uh, uh, with this reformist feminist and very critical vision so uh, maybe maybe uh, we we are reaching harmony kind of harmony you know so in in this very uncomfortable uh, position we feel paradoxic paradoxically you know now uh, comfortable it's like uh, some uh, you know it me in the, in the, in the in the it's it's uh, like spiritual satisfaction i, I think alhamdulillah Morky. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim and uh, thank you uh, Musawa and Ziba for organizing thing, uh, this and I want to thank the audience for their interest um, and um, for me what brings me individually to this project is um, uh, experiential uh, as well as intellectual, experiential meaning spiritual so uh, since I was four years old before I even went to school I started uh, memorizing the Quran like many Muslim kids uh, and I was intrigued in its, in its aesthetics, in its musicality, I didn't understand it then. Uh, and then when I was growing up in Egypt as a teenager, I was always intrigued in this book as, a, as a, in its ethical message. I, I didn't really under, um, did any systematic reading, but intuitively I felt like this was a, a book that had something very meaningful and deep to teach me ethically. And I think this is something that different Muslims also growing up by sense feel it, you know, like, for example, in Arabic, in a daily day interactions, we say, for example, uh, be conscious of God, this is like calling people to be their higher ethical self. And I was particularly intrigued in Sheikh uh, Metwali uh, Ba'sha'arawi's, who was a famous Egyptian exegist giving TV shows, he, he really mastered the Quranic language and tafsir, but he always um, left me disappointed, uh, bless his soul, he died when it came to gender. And I felt this, there was a disconnect with how I feel about the Quran. Uh, and I was just a teenager. Another key point was I went with my father uh, in the mid seventies to the movie Uridu Hallan, a, a very famous Egyptian movie. And it was my first time in the movie theater as well. What and does it, it mean? Uridu and it Hallen? means I want a solution. And this was a movie that really captured the anguish and the injustice that Egyptian women felt in trying to get uh, divorce, you know, and it was uh, the female actor was by Fatin Hamama, a very well-known Egypt. And I, I was like 
10, 12 or something like that, preteen. And it really spoke to me, the, the, her anguish at the end of the movie when she's crying and cannot understand how can this be just, right? And it talked and it was before Khola was legislated in Egypt. Intellectually, I've been working on uh, family law, as you said, Ziba, and, and I had that opportunity to do it in Egypt for a, and look at it from different perspectives. And I realized even when we look at legal reform, whether from courtroom practices or activist strategies, we always come back back to the issue of religious knowledge and how do we understand text and how do we uh, what religious knowledge is used to justify or discredit egalitarian laws so that led me to interest in islamic feminism and islamic hermeneutics uh, so i studied it i started working with umayma on divorce chapters and then this led me thankfully to musawa and then working with these two amazing soul sisters i call them and mentors uh, in this job um, in this project and what i i absolutely agree with them i think this discomfort uh, uncomfortable place is a good place also because it allows mm -hmm us to be uh, rigorous but also have humility to be always self-reflective um and uh, and i want to just to add to what they said is that we also help each other really learn not just spiritually but also which is very important for us but also intellectually and not shy away from difficult questions so asma for example has a very good eye for linguistic insights i've Umayma and I learned so much from her on that aspect, as well as many other strengths that she brings to this collaborative work. And Umayma is amazing in terms of the ethical insights that she comes up with. And like they said, you know, we help each other learn, we help each other ask difficult questions. Are we apologists? Are we reading modernist notions into the Quran? How are we grounding this in the tradition while being critically in engaged uh, with it? So. Um, and for me, what it highlighted was is that how the uh, question of Islamic feminist hermeneutics is for me, uh, from working with these amazing uh, mentors and uh, colleagues, is that first and foremost is also a question of really engaging with Quranic ethical mm -hmm. ethics. You know, it's not just it's beyond gender equality. It contributes to understanding systematically the Quranic ethics and hence this gender justice project can be linked to other social justice projects. So it's very comprehensive. Absolutely. There can be no gender justice without the justice in society. Yeah. Gender is part of it, really. That is absolutely important. Absolutely. And Mulki, I must add uh, that you are a fantastic uh, in organizing, structuring, and seeing the wider picture. So you are, I have worked with you for now over 10 years. So you three are amazing. And we are so happy that you are working on this. So my next question is that from this uncomfortable place, which is actually the only place to be for understanding, for approaching the divine, how, what is your approach? How do you approach the Quran? And I want to ask Mulki to start this and then Umayma would continue. Uh, certainly, and uh, perhaps maybe we, uh, I can have my colleagues uh, uh, share uh, the, the slide. So our methodology, we're not starting from scratch. We are building on other scholars who've really been trying to engage with the question of uh, how do you approach the Quran ethically? How can the Quran be a main source of Islamic ethics? And these scholars uh, can be grouped into two uh, groups. One is these reformist thinkers who since the uh, uh, 50s and the 60s have been, uh, and then some of them contemporary have been engaging with that like Muhammad Daraz, like Fazlur Rahman, like the Japanese Isutsu. Um, recently also there's uh, uh, Mu'taz al-Khatib. Uh, and so we, we engage with that work, we build on it. But we specifically want to acknowledge our uh, debt, intellectual debt to Islamic feminist uh, uh, scholars who really have been engaging with this question. And first and foremost is Amina Wadud. Uh, who really try to foreground and develop and implement uh, the idea of a holistic, ethically oriented reading to the Quran. What does it mean to approach the Quran holistically? What does it mean to um, uh, try to understand its 
ethical worldview and then engage with the question of gender within that, as well as Barless and others. So we're really building on, on that work. And so the methodology we came up with ha is multidimensional. So it's holistic. And what do we mean by that? It means when we approach the Quran, we see the theological, the ethical, the, uh, and the normative interconnected. So when we engage with the question of marriage, we engage with it within the larger theological questions of what does it mean that uh, we are God's vicegerent on earth? What does it mean that the Quranic mandate calls us to uh, you know, uh, enact taqwa? What does it mean that we are uh, created from one nafs, from one soul? So we, we engage with these specific themes within these larger theological and spiritual messages of the Quran. Uh, that leads us to if we're with the question of marriage, uh, thematic. Our approach departs from what our traditional mufassirin did. So we do not interpret the verses atomistically verse by verse. We group all the verses together thematically and look at different aspects of marriage, uh, spousal relationships, entering into marriage, divorce, uh, parenting. We group them all together and we see what happens when you read all these verses together and what whole thematic whole do they constitute. And it's historical in the sense that we, our premise is this is a sacred text that has a universal message, but it was revealed in a historical context to a particular community that had a particular history, that had a particular norms. And when we say historical, we don't mean that we want to revel relativize. It's not, the end goal is not to say, well, this verse is really about seventh century Arabia, and therefore it's not relevant to us. But it's more like even these verses that are specifically historical. What is the ethical intent behind them? And how can they speak to us now? So in that dimension, it's building on Fazlur Rahman's work on double movement. We pay attention to the language, uh, the key terms, and how we can we identify key terms. What does it mean when Nushuz appears in one verse and the other verse? Well, what does it mean when marriage is referred to as nikah, as mitaq, and my colleague Asma will elaborate on that. And then how can some terms become uh, concepts? And this is uh, our function as concepts, particularly with the ethical work. And this is uh, a part also where we've been informed and draw on some of the work that Mu'attaz al-Khatib has been doing from Kyle. And it's intertextual, which is interpreting the Quran by the Quran. It's not something we invented. Early exegetes used to do that. Unfortunately, they used to do that to cement patriarchal interpretations. We're interested in looking at how different units of verses speak to one another. When you look at different divorce verses and put them in marriage, how do they speak to each other? Uh, and most of all, um, it's ethically oriented. And, and that one, we try to really develop it systematically and it unpack it. And what I want to do is hand it over to Umayma, my colleague, to ex really explain that last dimension, with it, which is a key dimension uh, for us. Umayma, do you want to take over? Yes. And Morty, next time, would you please slow down a little bit? Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll do that. Yeah. So interesting. I didn't want to interrupt you. Okay. Um, Umayma. Yes. It's uh, not uh, before we get into um, uh, this ethical, uh, particularly ethical concepts, ethical terms that uh, Mulki referred to, we want, I want to go back to the idea of uh, why why are we doing this? What because you know, as we said, we're interested in the in the wider question of ethics of Quranic ethics, not just in relation to gender ethics and to egalitarian ethics in general, but to other. Uh, uh, issues as well that we maybe you're gonna mention later. Uh, but the three of us were, were looking into three three different uh, levels of works on ethics in Islam or uh, uh, the tafsir. We are of course interested in the tafsir tradition. We read and we learn. We're not starting from scratch. We're not uh, uh, you know randomly doing impressionistic. Uh, interpretations of, of the Quran, but we, we do read the classical uh, tafsir tradition, that's one level. We are also interested in the uh, uh, 
modern scholarship and the contemporary, very contemporary scholarship that's called the ethical turn, you know, the revival of interest in ethics in Islam. We have read, uh, you know, the names of the scholars that Mulki uh, uh, mentioned that we, we still feel inspired by the works of Fazl Rahman, Draz, Isuzu, uh, uh, Professor Khalid Abul Fadlan, and more recently, Dr. Nathan Khatib. We, we look at this modern uh, scholarship uh, also. However, what we feel we need to, to contribute now at this moment is that looking at the classical tradition, specifically but specifically the tafsir, right? Specifically Quranic tafsir. Uh, and modern and contemporary scholars have also observed that, that there hasn't been uh, a systematic uh, uh, ethical approach in the classical exegesis. And if you look at the literature, it's a huge prolific tradition of Quranic tafsir, centuries, right? Uh, they, they're always grouped either according to juristic schools, um, theological schools, you know, the Kalam and the Mu'tazila, uh, or according to Sufi schools, or, but, but never, there's never been a major classical tafsir from beginning to end that, uh, uh, that takes the ethical approach. Of course, there is ethical literature. Uh, in philosophy and in, in theology and, and, and scholars have commented that it's mostly, again, uh, engages with Greek philosophy on, and Greek and, and um, ethics and the concepts of ethics in Greek philosophy. Uh, even in modern 20th century uh, 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 tafsir works, also it's very rare to have uh, a brisk, really uh, um, um, uh, a work that would take the uh, the ethical uh, uh, approach systematically from beginning to end. Of course, the ethical issues uh, emerge in the tafsir of surahs and verses, uh, but not as the main the main gate. So we feel like if we're able to at least scrutinize the gender verses, right, from that systematic you know ethical approach that Murki was was explaining the intertextual and taking into consideration all these factors and really scrutinizing the gender verses from that, maybe you're able to, to narrow the gap between theorizing and the textual interpretation. Because you can find a lot of theories about Quranic ethics. We're, we're not in, in inventing the wheel here, right? But is it, in, is it uh, applied to the gender verses specifically, right? In, in the textual, the, the tafsir, right? So we're, we're we want to do this, right? Um, and the intertextual part uh, that Mulki mentioned, again, very rare, um, rare in, 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 the, um, in most of the classical and the modern uh, uh, FSC, the connections that are made uh, among uh, uh, the verses, it, it, is, um, it is mostly philological or in terms of juristic, yeah, and the exegetes will say, okay, this word here, uh, yes, it, it occurs in other verses, and the, what's the root, and what's the, philo you know, the philology of, of the term, uh, or in terms of the rulings, the, the juristic ruling. Well, if this verse has this ruling, but then there's another verse, and then the whole Nasikh and Mansukh discussion, the whole abrogation, the issue of, of abrogation. So it's, it, when the connections are made, they're mostly interested in juristic issues or philological and linguistic issues. Rarely to deduce the ethical meaning, particularly when it applies to gender. Rarely you will find an exegete, or, or not just rarely, but none, an exegete who would uh, link the mawadda and rahma in that verse with uh, a divorce or a marriage uh, ruling, right? Uh, so there's a disconnect between the ethical and the legal. A lot of legal reasoning in the tafsir, a lot of legal reasoning, but rarely ethical reasoning. Is this right? Is this uh, rahmah? Uh, mm -hmm. that, that kind of questioning and query uh, is, uh, so there's a disconnect. And as a result of, of these gaps that we see, um, um, of course, exegetes allowed allowed for their culture, uh, you know, for their times. Uh, 
to uh, uh, to govern their perspective on the verses. Uh, they allowed the patriarchal assumptions about gender relations, about male authority, about women's inferiority, allowed that as to be the lens through which they can see a particular verse. And when a, when a verse is very clearly about equality, they just don't see it. They, they explain it very superficially and they leave it, right? They don't come back to it again in, in, other, uh, in other gender uh, uh, verses. Uh, and as a result, we, we reach the, the conclusion is that what is the fiqhi, what is the juristic definition uh, uh, of marriage or the, the distorted conception of marriage, again mentioned by Mulki or, or Asma, uh, is that it's similar to slavery. It's an, it, it's an exchange of uh, legal uh, sex, or um, Ziba, sorry, Ziba mentioned that in the introduction. Uh, it's, it, uh, it's a contract, it's a bargain, uh, uh, the exchange of uh, legal sex for uh, provision. That is the definition, as, uh, as we know, in uh, uh, the juristic uh, definition. So we reach uh, um, a very sad, <laughs> distorted conception of, of marriage. Whereas in, in the Quran, now that we want to look at the Quranic ethics, um, perhaps we can move to the, to the next. Um, yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, look at the Quranic ethics. Of course, this is, these are not all the, the Quranic ethics in the Quran, but um, we can look at, you know, as, uh, as Dr. Amno did, let's read the Quranic ethics for gender, right? Reading for gender. Uh, this is very clear. Let's look at some of, of, of these Quranic ethics and how they are paired. And also when we look at them, we find that all of them the 10 that I'm going to mention now and how they are mentioned in the verses together, uh, they all occur in verses in relation to women, in relation to marital relations, in relation to mothers also, but particularly Al-Bir, number five, but we can go uh, through them one by one. Adl and Qist, right? They occur together in the Quran, always in reference to women and orphans and justice, and fairness or equality and equity. Three and four, ma'roof and ihsan, goodness and then kindness or moral beauty that Amira Abu Talib uh, beautifully <laughs> really uh, analyzed it as a concept in the Quran last week. Uh, but ma'roof and ihsan, always in the divorce verses, right? Always in the verses that are, uh, that, that can lead, you know, the, the, the situation of divorce, how it can lead to, to abuse and always ma'roof and ihsan. Apply this, right? Al-bir, uh, al-bir and al-taqwa. Bir being righteousness, graciousness, or taqwa is either uh, piety or God consciousness. Again, ta'awanu al-bir wa taqwa Notice that these Quranic ethics or these Quranic terms or concepts they're more than just virtue ethics. They're more than just personal virtues. Of course, they are personal virtues that we're all uh, required as Muslims to, to, to apply to them. But they, they always occur in the verses with a clear divine commandment. Do this, right? Do birr or taqwa. It's something that you do. It's something that governs the conduct and supposed to govern also ruling. Al Mawadda uh, Rahma, of course, uh, uh, Asma will talk about this the affection, the compassion. These are two main Quranic ethics specifically on marriage, right? Al uh, Afu al Fadl. Afu is tolerance, magnanimity. It does occur in a divorce uh, 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 verse as well. It's, it's very important how to exercise magnanimity, how to be tolerant for, for both men and women, for both husbands and wives. Uh, Al-Fadl also occurs as giving generously towards each other, towards one another, uh, uh, bountifulness. Now, a, a concept that sort of gathers uh, uh, all these uh, Quranic uh, ethics or ethical concepts mentioned are the word hudud. Hudud is boundaries, Tilka Hadud Allah, God's ethical boundaries, 
And it's very interesting, uh, again, mentioned in marriage and divorce verses always, always mm. repeated, repeated very often. These are God's boundaries, right? Okay. And it's very, in Asma was just telling, just saying this in one of our meetings, how there's a difference uh, between the juristic conception of the word hadood boundaries, it's 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 it, uh, yeah, she will talk about the, the juristic conception of hadood, and what we would like to highlight is that it is an ethical boundary as well, not just not just the punishment, not just thank the you, Mar thank you, Omana, for this. Yes, this is amazing uh, because that actually provides a different way of looking at the, at the Quran. And what you are doing is part of the new methodology, reformist methodology. And, and also being women is important, I think. You know, seeing um, from the perspective of women is uh, important. Asma, now I want to ask you that, what are you finding about uh, marriage? What does the Quran tell us about marriage? We know very well, you know, what fact tells us about marriage. But in fact, uh, what you have really shown, um, uh, Murki and um, Umayma, is that we really do not have uh, serious work on ethics and relating ethical concepts to legal concepts. So Asma, I want to ask you, uh, what are your fun findings so far and what does the key uh, key teachings that Quran gives us about marriage. Yes, Ziba. Uh, throughout this different approach, uh, uh, Mulki uh, talk about this historical and linguistic and intertextual. This different approach. Throughout this, uh, uh, we found four interconnected, you know, Quranic ethical domains in which marriage is constructed. Uh, and we found also a strong and well, you know, structured uh, Quranic worldview on marriage mm -hmm. and gender uh, relations. So uh, uh, seeking for the basic cohesion and connection between all the issue of marriage uh, within the text, in the, in the text, we, uh, we finally found these uh, four broad domains, uh, which we can, uh, which we understand as stages in the marriage relationship. So the four, the, these four domains are, the first one is about uh, a central ethical uh, uh, framework proposed by the Quran uh, about human relations in general and uh, family relations in particular. It's about the equal value of all human uh, 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 and uh, who are created, uh, created from the one, uh, one, one self uh, essence, nafs al wahida, and it's the uh, same equal pair or mate, zawjuha. Uh, the second domain is about the, uh, this, uh, the nature of the marriage and it's unique. Uh, as proposed by the, the Quran and described by the Quran as mitaq uh, al-ghalib. It means uh, an intense or strong, uh, you know, agreement between man and woman, wife and husband. The third domain, uh, we have the, the, the main ethical pillars, uh, ethical pillars that describe the marriage as ayatullah, uh, God signs with relational values as second. And second, we don't forget that second is, uh, second ilaha, uh, yaskuna ilaha is like a resting place. And mawadda is deep affection, rahma as compassion. So all these values are, uh, are not uh, from, for one or uh, other uh, partner, they are mutual and a mutual ethical attitude you know, to use toward, uh, towards the, uh, toward the other partner uh, in order to uh, build this uh, egalitarian human partnership. Uh, the last domain is about different aspects of marriage and family relations, uh, such as the choice of uh, marriage uh, of uh, the partner, 
uh, entering into, into marriage, how, uh, how uh, the Quran uh, uh, talk about entering in, in marriage, the responsibility and rights of the husband and, uh, and, and the wife, the child care, the marital discourse, the divorce, inheritance, all this aspect of marriage are treated within a, a, a units or groups, uh, groups of verses. And at the same time, they are delimited by ethical directives and highlighted by the, the, the text itself. Such these ethical directives are, uh, for example, Al Maruf, uh, uh, Umayma uh, talk about it as a common good, uh, the, the ihsan as beauty, the fadl generosity, the qist as fairness, the adl justice, the afu forgiveness, tashawar uh, uh, as a mutual uh, consultation. So this different, uh, this different aspect of marriage cannot be read or interpreted out of their textual context and out of the ethical directives uh, of this moral uh, uh, guideline, which define, define them, you know, define them within a set of verse, of, of verse. So these four domains are part of the Quranic worldview and each verse cannot or can't be understood without reference to others. Asma, can you share, can you um, give, be more specific and uh, give us an application of this methodology to a set of verses, how it works? Yeah, uh, so we, uh, uh, I, I, uh, I choose these, uh, these, uh, these uh, verses from uh, 1 to 30 uh, from uh, 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 Surat An-Nisa, uh, and uh, we will, uh, I, I will demonstrate with our methodology, uh, which, is inter, uh, which is interconnected, uh, 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 that um, the centrality of the Quran ethics here. So the, uh, the application of this ethical oriented uh, on one unity is very, very interesting. So, uh, when we read the surah, for example, the first time when we, we read surah uh, Nisa, for example, we feel as if there is no sense of linearity. And if the text is jumping from a topic to another, very different. But gradually, and with this multi-linked reading, we start to understand the own logic and the cohesion, you know, of the text. And how finally, the, 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 the Quran itself, it's like he is demanding to be taken holistically and uh, in its own terms and without fragmentation. So I will uh, 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 start with the first verse. Uh, this first verse, it's about a, a call to the old humanity, Ya Ayuhannas. It's a universe, universal call. And it's about human creation in its different stages, uh, which start with the onus of being, nafs al-wahida, then continues to this duality of being uh, uh, and its mates, wa khalaqa minha zawjuha, and then to the final stage that, uh, where uh, the Quran said, wa batta minhuma rijalan wa nisa'an, spread, uh, it's, he spread a broad multiplicity, many men and women. Just a, a, a word about uh, the, the um, linguistic uh, approach. The word nafs is feminine here, uh, nafs as a, as a sur in Arabic, while the mate, uh, zawjuha, is masculine. And working with, um, with um, Umayma and, uh, <coughs> and Mulki, we, we feel like it's a symbolic of the reciprocity in human relationship, you know? And, uh, so all this first part of this verse is about a global uh, equality, equality of human, equality in the gender couple, gender couple through the concept of zawji al, al zawjiya, and uh, 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 we have to uh, uh, you know to highlight here that this equality is linked to two important ethical concepts, taqwa and arham. 
And taqwa here has multi meaning, uh, uh, multi meaning. So we we will just limit it to God devotion, as everybody knows her. But also, it means commitment with justice. Adilu huwa akrab li taqwa. So taqwa and justice is the same. And arham, it's a plural of uh, uh, in Arabic, it's a plural of rahm, which means uh, womb. It's the feminine place, you know, the source, the source of human life. So it's very important to see here the 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 the, the, the link between all this uh, uh, between the human creation until the womb as a source of human life. The second verse is directly after this one uh, uh, after the equal human equal human creation. We have a second group of verse. Uh, with uh, an imperative recommendation about orphans. Uh, and uh, here we don't see orphans because many tafsir uh, talk about orphans uh, female. And I don't see that, you know, taqul yatama. There is no, uh, uh, t uh, no uh, explication or explanation which is man, uh, uh, male or female. So, it's about orphan, male and female, to give them their property and to not consume it because it's a great sin. The third verse, the third verse, uh, we can notice here first the use, very important, the use twice of the conditional structure of if you fear, if you fear, in the first part and the second part, if you fear. So the fear. Uh, uh, to not deal fairly with the orphans. And here also, it's not about only orphans girls. It's about orphans uh, child, ma uh, male and female. And the fear, the second fear, it's a fear to not be just with co-wives. And the fear we, uh, to not be uh, uh, fair with the orphans is directly linked to the possibility to marry two, three, or four women. So, Directly then, we have another warning. Uh, another warning addressed to men, because all these verses are addressed to men, to the men of this context, which tell them that the simple fact of feeling that they cannot be just in this polygamous marriage uh, forces them to stay with one. So we see uh, uh, so just to stay with one, oh, it's not and one or a slave for this for this time. Here there is a fundamental ethical directive, not doing injustice toward orphans and co-wives, but to understand the link between orphans and uh, and uh, and co-wives and the possibility to uh, to marry the many wives, uh, two, three, or, five, or, uh, or four, we need to learn more about the historical context. We can't explain this without uh, 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 without uh, uh, the, 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 the historical context. And here there is different expl explanation. They are very classical, very, very famous. Uh, the one is the Arabian 7th century because these verses were was uh, revealed between uh, before the Battle of Uhud, and many women become uh, without uh, mothers, and also uh, because polygamy was unlimited cultural traditions. Tradition, so the Quran uh, tried to put a restriction to only four. Uh, we can't understand the topic of polygamy out of the textual and historical context, yes. And uh, for me, there is here a Quranic warning to the man. To be fair and just, especially in this specific context of war, towards these women and these children who are losing their husband, fathers, and their providers. So it is a recommendation to act for justice and responsibility and protection toward all these vulnerable people, widows, orphans. So polygamy here uh, is here a possible option for an exceptional context. 
And this possibility or option is rooted in the same ethical framework of all the, 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 the group of the verse, you know, acting, fairy, and with justice. It's all about providing safety for vulnerable people in the histi historical context of a cultural polygamy, slavery, patriarchy. So in this context, monogamy is recommended because it's more just. And this is all about justice and fairness, and not about a sexual permission to have many wives as the mentality and the fiqh understood as a man white and uh, if polygamy is the symbol of masculine power. The fourth verse is about giving women their sadaq. So sadaq, uh, uh, giving women their sadaq kindly as a free gift and the Quran used the term of nihla. And nihla in Arabic is to give something for free, bidun muqabil. There is the possibility uh, also in the second uh, part of the verse for the wife to give up freely, also fa a part of this dower to, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, her husband. Uh, who can easily take it also. So the sadaq here is assumed as a woman right, but she can also freely share it, uh, uh, share, a, share a par with her husband. We don't see here, it's very important. We don't see here the classical fiqhi deal of sadaq in, ex in ex exchange of wife's obedience, star. No word of, uh, about this. The husband give her the sadaq without asking her something. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a gift, it's without muqabil in exchange. And she also can share uh, or offer any part of this, uh, this gift to him. So it's about mutual you know, kindness, mutual generosity. And there is absolute, absolutely no imposition from anyone. Because as I see it, this union should be lived as a gift also, as a gift from Allah. The fifth verse um, is a recommendation to not give sufaha, uh, uh, the prop, um, your property, because he is addressing to men or women and saying, well, to, to sufaha amwalukum. And what means sufaha? Sufaha in Arabic is the plural of safih. And Safi in Arabic, it's al mudtarib al naqis al aql the person who acts uh, unwisely or imprudently, or it, he is a weak uh, minded, uh, jahil, or ignorant. This is the traduction or translation, translation in Arabic. And here in this verse, we see that even this, if these persons are sufaha, it's not in the wrong term because. Uh, look at the, 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 the following. It's وَقُولُوا لَهُمْ قَوْلًا مَعْرُوفًا وَرْزُقُوهُمْ فِيهَا وَأُكْسُوهُمْ وَقُولُوا لَهُمْ قَوْلًا مَعْرُوفًا So, uh, uh, even uh, uh, this person, as, uh, as they don't know how to deal with money and position, and position the Quran asks people to provide them and to be kind with them. But the problem here, that the majority you know, the majority of the, of the classic tafsir have interpreted sufaha as only, uh, as represented by only women and children, but all women are sufaha. Uh, you know, even in the, in the encyclopedia, even in the, in the tra translation in Arabic, sufaha, when they say uh, weak-minded and they say women are weak-minded. And uh, we see here that nothing supports this kind of interpretation, which is, which is typically misogynic. Sufaha is not a gendered term here. So uh, they can be men or women who can uh, not, uh, you know, they can't handle uh, dealing with money or property or properties. The sixth verse is again here with the topic of about uh, of uh, orphans and how to test them, you know, uh, test them in their abilities, 
until they reach marriageable age. حتى, uh, uh, فإذا بلغوا النكاح. And uh, they are able to have a reasonable judgment. فإن أنستم منهم رشدا. Here it's a recommendation addressed to those men or women, we don't know, who have the guardianship of orphans to return their, their uh, uh, property to them if they fulfill these two conditions. So here there is two topics, very important. The, the first one is the same recommendation, once again, to be fair with the orphans. The second is about ethical markers, you know, on the age of marriage. And we see the link between 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 marriage nikah and maturity. So the capacity to manage to manage owns affair and to be uh, uh, married. So this, here there is a strong ethical principle to be considered uh, for the appropriate age of marriage and how uh, we see here how there is no valid argument, you know, for child marriage, as we see uh, uh, in some uh, uh, fiqh uh, uh, compilation. The seventh verse, just after the verse, uh, uh, the seventh verse, please. Uh, it's about the verse about how to deal with the property of orphans. And here the subject is uh, this time, um, uh, concerned heritage after the excuse me after the, the, the you know the, how to deal with the property of orphans we have the subject of uh, the heritage left by the the, the parents and relatives so it's about nasib nasib so nasib is equal share for men and women from what is left by parents and uh, those nearest relatives. At this, time, at this stage, the verse does not specify the respective parts. It uh, just reflects the intention to order the right of inheritance to both men and women with a determined nasib, uh, no matter how big or small. So the historical context here is also very, very important because it's allow, allow us to affirm that this verse, you know, open the way for a deep social uh, revolution for this time. Uh, and Esbab al Nuzul, the occasion of the revelation, the revelation show us that it was revealed just after a uh, wider mother complains about how male cousins of her husbands has taken all the husband's money and uh, uh, let her with three daughters without nothing to live on. So this first is actually a statement, you know, of the right of women to have their own and their legitimate part of the inheritance as for men. And this, despite, despite the fact that the tradition of the time, you know, denied women the right to inherit because they did not uh, uh, meet the criteria, the criteria of inheritance, uh, especially the defense of the tribe uh, uh, to uh, to breaking back the spoils of Wargana Imil Har, breeding a horse. So despite all this, uh, despite the fact that they don't, uh, they did not enter to the to this uh, to this uh, criteria, the Quran here, I think, bring down these standards by giving them the right to inherit like men. The eighth verse. Uh, um, here, the, the, this, uh, this verse is about extending this sharing, this nasib, nasib, also to those who might be present at this time, like the other relatives, orphan, uh, the needy, or poor people, masakin, so al-yatama uh, masakin uh, So they should have the right to have a part of this, uh, uh, this sharing. It's about including also those who normally have no right to inheritance. So it is about social family and social solidarity. And even with uh, 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 ethical speech, So uh, uh, here, this is a very uh, other important uh, uh, thing that we have to remind that the fiqh have completely forget this verse. Uh, and he left aside this verse in their legal rules. There is no rules about it. 
uh, and uh, all five uses. Asma, with... can I ask you to wrap up at this stage? You know, what can you? Can I'm you? Yes, yes. Uh, can you summarize a little bit? Yeah, I'm finishing because uh, there is the other the, the all the other uh, following verses nine, ten, and. Mm. Eight, and uh, uh, 12 are all about you know uh, the distribution uh, of uh, of inheritance the distribution of the parts you know the parts of uh, of uh, specific parts to between children wives parents uh, uh, and uh, the last verse I will, I will i will talk about the last verse because we do we don't have time the last verse is very important because it's like mm. it's it, Finishing, uh, it's the end of this group of the uh, this unity of verse. It's about, as uh, Umayma uh, uh, said, it's about this very important uh, recommendation of Hudud Allah. And the uh, uh, Hudud here uh, 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 in Arabic, it's the plural of the term had. And lingu linguistically, it means uh, prevention or prohibition or, or bounds. It means, you know, these ethical, uh, this, uh, this um, limits, this ethical directive toward uh, orphan, woman, poor, tilka uh, hudud Allah. So uh, uh, here it is clear that the hudud set by God regarding the practice of marriage and divorce and inheritance are these ethic boundary, boundaries. And in none of them, uh, uh, in none of the verse, uh, uh, hudud refer to punishment, as we see in the fiqh, where this term is mainly associated with punishment. Uh, so I, I will termine, I will finish here. What can be deduced as ethical norms from these groups of verses? So uh, with this interlinked thematic from the origin of the human creation, there is thematic of inheritance, solidarity, sharing, protection of the orphan, the vulnerable people, with the recurrence of ethical values of justice, ad, fairness, taqwa, and hudud Allah. So I see that the common trade, you know, from the first verse uh, um, until, you know, the hudud, it's about, you know, uh, uh, it's about I think protecting of all of these mustadafin, all the vulnerable, all the oppressed people, and uh, uh, and to take care, to be fair, and to be just toward them. So the main concept of the Quran is this, in this unity is to protect vulnerable people who throw the who throw the throughout the history of humanity are always represented by this orphan, the poor, the women as a discriminated social category. So what we, we must uh, understand here, it is whatever our context is to, uh, to be online with the Quran is in our reality, means to respect rigorous mm -hmm. this ethic of justice. Thank you. Thank you, Asma. That was fascinating. And actually that uh, tells us quite a lot which can have a great deal on Im implication on rethinking the way that we understand marriage, the norms of the marriage, the practices of marriage, and also the laws of in Muslim co uh, context. So this is, these are the questions that I now want to turn to Omaima and Morki to ask what are the implications of your findings? What are the implications of your approach today, if, both for norms, and also the laws that inform marital relationships. Yes, <clears throat> yes. Uh, the implications, of course, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're contributing <laughs> as women, as, as women Muslims, uh, or we're trying to contribute to the Islamic, to Islamic knowledge in general, whether to the tafsir tradition or to the Islamic ethics, as we were saying at the beginning, and as Ziba, you were saying at the beginning, that uh, the work of, of women mufassirin or women interpreters, particularly, is very rare uh, because we all have, you know, we're afraid to, to do this, uh, right? Because the intimidating uh, uh, male tafsir tradition. Uh, but we're agreeing that the Quran is not for men only, right? 
so we're trying through using this new perspective, the perspective of, of women, Muslimat's perspective uh, on the Quran, on the ethics, on gender justice, on the, the egalitarian ethic, on critiquing the patriarchal assumptions, as Asma was showing in, in, in one verse, for instance, and, and other verses. Uh, we're hoping through this new um, to contribute to the science of tafsir itself by highlighting maybe certain things, by completing what has been missing or incomplete or gap in, uh, in, in the tradition. You know, why not? This, this is a right, a right of every Muslim person. Uh, and the, Islam, the, the science of Islamic ethics also, we were saying that it's mostly theoretical and rarely applied ethics. So this is a, a, a field, you know, gender, gender relations, marriage, women, mothers. This is a field where you can apply uh, uh, the Quranic ethics textually on, 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 uh, uh, on, on the Quran and in raising uh, gender justice issues. So we're hoping to do this, yani, inshallah. Uh, and then we can, we're also highlighting for traditional mainstream feminism. And as you know, this is a very, very long story. Um, the history of, of mainstream feminism, particularly uh, uh, that is in, in embedded in, in, in secular modernity, there will always be assumption that you can, it is incompatible. Uh, you know, the traditional view on feminism is that it is incompatible with any religion, any religious tradition, any religious faith. Uh, you cannot have both a feminist consciousness and religious faith. Uh, uh, but again, we're showing in an in an applied way that you can have both. And of course, this idea has been around for a very long time in other religious feminisms in Christianity and Judaism and Buddhism and other uh, religious traditions, the, the application of, of feminist hermeneutics and feminist tafsir on sacred texts. So we're, we're, we're showing that also, hopefully, and we're demonstrating that uh, as well, yeah. Um, okay, now you. Yes, sorry. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, very important implications on a number of uh, levels. Uh, at first, on the individual level. So for someone who's a seeker, who's interested in the Quran, uh, interested in understanding the Quran as a source of ethics, uh, just imagine if we try to read the Quran differently. So taking the marriage uh, as an example, imagine if you bring all the verses of marriage, divorce, and parenting together. Visually, you pay, make for yourself a chart and start first with what are the key uh, theological messages of the Quran. Let me start with that, the idea that we're created from nafsin wahida, that we have a mandate to show and enact taqwa. Okay, and then that marriage is a mithaq. And then the pillars are, it's mawadda, sakan, wa rahma. And then there are these different themes that uh, 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 Asma beautifully explained, you know, like polygamy, whatever, dawr, okay, historically, as well as the universal element to it. And paying attention to the ethical principles. Let's see individually if we read the Quran that way, you know, and then what message comes out? I think it, it, this, I think the implication is also to change how we engage with the Quran in order to get the ethical message and how to make the linkages between the ethical, the normative, and always take it back to the theological message, to the spiritual message, the central foundational message of this book. So I think that is really important individually uh, as an implication from this project. And, and it, it speaks to the idea that reform and change needs to happen on multiple levels. I think the other implication of this project is that the linkages, if we uh, understand uh, very systematically the Quran as a book of ethics, not to say that it's irrelevant, but precisely because it's relevant, how we can make linkages between different ethical projects. You know, the fact that the Quran talks a lot about nature, uh, about vulnerable groups. Uh, so how can we also look at different 
social justice projects, uh, environmental issues in light of uh, Quran ethical principles. And definitely the implication of this approach is definitely rethinking uh, fiqhi rulings on marriage, rethinking some of the theoretical frameworks we have in usul al-fiqh, precisely, for example, this idea of there's ayat al-ahkam, and it's very, you know, like, okay, you look at the divorce verses and what the juries got out of it was that, like, uh, oh, God, uh, we should have marriage guardian because it says, you know, right? But if this kind of reading implies that certainly if we focus and we foreground these ethical principles and concepts and we take them back to the foundational messages, it, it completely means definitely the implication revisiting husband's right to unilateral repudiation, that they can unilaterally sever the marriage, uh, this idea of unequal divorce rights, um, this idea that uh, uh, sexual rights within marriage is uh, first and foremost the husband's right and the woman's right is kind of like implicit and more her right is obedience and, and the right to the financial uh, rights. So it certainly means revisiting completely uh, these uh, rulings on marriage and divorce, uh, which are uh, which are in, um, in disconnect with Quranic ethical principles. But what does that mean? Because in this project, taking back to what Ziba said, it's about reconstructing as well, not just deconstructing. We're not only critiquing; we want to. We're exploring alternatives. Does that mean we are advocating, or the implication is context sensitive? Uh, rulings, uh, uh, how, how does that work the legally, you know, because we are interested in the linkages between the ethical and, and, and the legal. Uh, that's something that we're still discussing. And one advantage of this project is that it's um, we're looking at this issue from different perspectives. So we have colleagues working on usul al-fiqh, colleagues working on tafsir and Quran, colleagues working on the history of uh, Muslim communities. And the answer hopefully will be holistic coming from all these um, different collaborative uh, uh, studies within this project. Thank you. That was an incredibly important conversation for us. And uh, I, I now want um, to open it to question. And thank you, Molki, for the way that you summarized the, the, real, the real intention of the project and also the important contribution that you're making to this project. But before um, closing down, we have a number of questions. So let's uh, go to the questions and then uh, we might have um, the final, uh, if we have time, we have the final words among ourselves. So there is uh, three questions that were very much related and I read them all together. Can you please give examples of instances when you are uncomfortable with the text and say how how are you uncomfortable and how do you deal with that? And another one is that from your reading and approach, would you say confidently that one of the maqsad or intention objectives of the text, Sharia is actually gender justice or are you imposing your own contemporary, our own contemporary notions on the text anachronistically like this? So, this is also related to that question. And could you um, uh, actually, uh, could the text actually be trying to tell us something else other than gender equality? These uh, related questions. Who is going to start? Murky, you go. Of Asma, Asma, I saw your hand. Yeah, no, I just uh, uh, want to start with this uh, question. Uh, what, what part uh, uh, makes us uncomfortable? I think that uh, we have this, this, this discussion with uh, Mulki and uh, Umayma, and uh, we have to confess that uh, there's some, some verses are very, you know, uh, we have just, um, uh, we are in trouble, trouble you know, uh, we, 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 we feel that there is something good 
<laughs> behind the, the finality that we, we can't understand the, 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 um, the meaning or what the Quran want to, want to say, especially, um, and uh, I think that uh, everybody knows about this term of Daraba in um, the end of uh, Surat uh, of Ayat al Qiwama. It makes us very uncomfortable. And uh, all the explanation that we have now, as Umayma said every time, are not very, con they, 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 they don't convince, convince us, you know. Um, going, uh, you know, leaving the 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 the, the woman or this uh, very, uh, you know, to be very kind when you are uh, uh, slighting your uh, your uh, your wife. So this is the kind of verses uh, which is very problematic for us. But uh, with this faith-oriented, uh, you know, uh, reading, uh, we uh, it's not we accept it, but we said that. Maybe um, there is something here. Maybe uh, we are wrong in our understanding, and maybe uh, uh, how I how I, uh, I I don't know how I express uh, because it's just like something uh, in contradiction with all the worldview of the Quran from uh, for 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 the family for women for uh, all this very nice you know concept uh, that the Quran used for for uh, marriage as wabashiruhunna libas hunna libasun lakum wa antum libasun lahum fa idha lamastum an-nisa al what there is many many what is that so beautiful terms describing the, the, the Quran. And we have this only one here, uh, which um, I don't know if it's just a, a proposition for the context. And uh, I, personally, I have a problem. I have a big problem with this verse. And uh, you know, in the first time I, 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 I was struggling, try, trying to explain it with the, very apologetic, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, form. But now I, I just give up. And I said that there okay. is something that I am not understanding. <laughs> yeah, it is a search. It is a search for understanding. Omaima, can you first unmute yourself? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, as, as Esma was saying, you, you know, you have to think with, with the abundance, with the great number of, of these verses that how how can we say it in a very yeah, blunt way that are so sweet yeah and there are verses that are so sweet directed to to men to to just calm down to let go of their ego to let go of their violence to let go of the so there has to be there's something not wrong but not logical in saying that with all these verses then there's another verse that tells husbands to, to, to lead their wives. No, it, it cannot be, yani, not just for a Muslim, but for any person believing in a just God, in any religion, any religious tradition, the, the, it cannot be consistent. So it has to mean something else, or it has to. Yani, I say it killer comfortably and not apologetically. And of course, there are several, yani, particularly I have two interpretations in mind, and we discuss these all the time, but this is not the place for it, uh, or, or the time. Uh, but have that perspective, and I, I just saw, by the way, I just saw a question, what do we tell activists, you know, working with women, you, you just have to trust that we are dealing with a just God, and a just God, I, I believe, cannot, would not, the God of the Quran, ask husbands, even back then, even in the 7th century, uh, to, to be their wives, you know, that's, just my take on it. unmute yourself, please. Yes, I, I mean, that, that is definitely uh, the key verse that I grapple with, as Umayma and Asma would attest to that. Also, I grapple with the verses uh, that address men about uh, women, uh, you know, like um, how to have sex with them within marriage, when to have sex with them, you know, and, and although the message is good, you know, it's like, uh, you know, be good, be sensitive, be just, uh, but it's addressed, uh, uh, you know, to men. 
not, and this book is supposed to be addressed to all of us, just like Umm Salama and early Muslims also took that issue with the Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And some of the verses that describe the, the Jannah, you know, although those are, can be resolved, you know, like the, the rewards of the paradise, you know, uh, but I think, and I'm, I, I still a search, as you said, Ziba, but I think some of the things that are definitely uh, on a faith based, I don't, I never question God's uh, justice, you know, but uh, I, I have an issue and I, I don't accept, I don't think, I don't find convincing this idea that Daraba means go away and all that. However, I think maybe what I'm trying to realize now is that the very historical dimension of the Quran, it doesn't mean it's not universal, it is relevant to us, but I'm, this aspect of that, it also was addressed to specific community to deal with specific issues, like for example, Surah al mujad and this woman who came to Muhammad and said, you know, he just severed my, our marital bond like that by saying, I am to him like the back of his mother. You know, that is a practice that was then, but the ethical intent behind it is that mm -hmm. men, you can't have this excessive power, you know? So for me, the historical dimension is this a way of maybe figuring out that there's an interactive aspect to the Quran that has to do with that particular patriarchal community, reforming them gradually. Maybe I'm trying to see if there's a way out there. You know, I haven't completely resolved it, but maybe in, uh, that's the way to go, I, I think, perhaps. And, and if I may address the uh, the gender equality thing, this thing, are we imposing this on the mm. Quran? And that's something for Aisha Hidayatullah, uh, you know, argues in her book, Feminist Edges of the Quran. Um, and I, I, I don't think so. I mean, I think it's, it's a, 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 diff, a wrong way to frame the question. The, I think, uh, of course, every person reads the Quran from their perspective, from, from a position, you know, so we can never be free floating outside our context. That was the case with uh, a tabari when he was trying to interpret it. That's the case with us now. That's the case will be with people who will come after that. So, um, but I think the question is, I think what people who ask that kind of question, I'm not saying the audience here, but someone like Hidayatullah, this kind of critique assumes or, or, for, or neglects this idea that I think is very important that the Quran really suggests an unfold, a gradual folding moral trajectory. This is something that Wadud wrote about, something that Khalid Abu Fadl wrote about, and others. And I think there's truth to that. If you read the Quran holistically, it really calls you to uh, that the work of figuring out what is just, what is ethically, is always ongoing, organic, and, and unfolding. And I and so I think there's a lack of attention to the ethical part, right? That mm. which is organic and dynamic. Yeah. I want to add also something on this. For any universal concept like justice to be meaningful, it has to go through a context. You know, if you, we can't have any concept, any universal concept, without taking into account that context of it. So the context is important. What was the context of revelation? And in fact, we have a lot of material that tells us why that verse 434 was revealed. And it was a case of dispute, a woman. So I, I don't want to go into it because people have written about it. And also uh, it was a woman who was hit by her husband after in Medina went to the prophet to complain. And then the, uh, the, we have in, uh, um, uh, in Shanul Nuzul, the occasion on revelation that the prophet says that I wanted something and God wanted something else. So it is a social order. It is something, it is there. And we must never forget the patriarchal context in which the Quran and all the religions reveal. But the question is, this context is part of the text? Our answer is definitely no. And those who are asking these questions, I think, is actually uh, not, um, not taking the role of the context in shaping 
our understanding of the text. This is how the previous uh, Mufassirin understood it, but I'm so happy that you're so honest to say that you have a problem. Because without honestly, without admitting that we are searching, we will never, never be truthful to the Quran and to our faith. To have faith means to have doubt, to have questions. So, so that is amazingly uh, important. And uh, can I go to second uh, set of questions? And we don't have much time, so I have to be uh, selective. One question, which is a complex question, but important is that uh, what you talked about is um, your interpretation, the ethical uh, domain. But what about the social interpretation that is meditating between theor theorizing textual uh, interpretation and also um, the light, uh, in light of patriarchy, feminist consciousness, and etc. In other words, the question is, how are the four ethical domains of marriage perceived and voiced by Muslim family members? So, you know, what is the working of this um, in reality, which is actually an aspect of the project that, uh, that we have not yet explored. But the question is important for us to have in mind. And the second question related to that is, does, uh, does the Quran present marriage as a contract for life or is marriage seen as something more fluid uh, malleable due to circumstances? So that divorce, for um, example, carries less taboo in um, uh, society. Uh, so basically it is, is there a fixed idea of marriage? Is a fixed idea of gender relationships? Who wants to go on this? A, a Reyma. Fixed, I, I think the, the, the question is about the, whether the longevity, the duration of marriage is, is right? Uh, is it a contract for life or the Quran is silent on that, right? It's, it's not a matter of how long it should be or how short it should be. Uh, the important thing, again, is the ethical niya. Niya is uh, the intent, uh, the conscience uh, on the part of uh, men and women is that you're entering a particular union um, with ethics and with the intent of companionship, of mawadda, of affection, of rahma, of mercy. But it, it is silent on whether it's a contract uh, for life uh, or what. And something that Asma uh, always uh, says, and we should respect the Quranic silences. You don't impose, again, the idea of uh, here you're imposing uh, patriarchal assumptions or, or, or whatever on what the Quran is silent on, right? I, I, I don't know, does Asma or Mulki have something to say about this? Uh, Unmute yourself first. Yeah, and, and Asma. And just, I, I, I want to just to add, add something uh, um, Umayma said, this is, I, I don't think that it's a contact for life because uh, there is many latitude open for divorce also it's something that we don't see in christianism which is mm. sacred uh, and just a sacrament and it's for all the life so i i think that the quran is more pragmatic more realistic here and uh, yes it's a stronger it's a mitakhali it's very important but there is problem there is a uh, in fiftum shikaq and shikaq it's conflict so uh, and uh, and uh, it give, the Quran gives the, 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 the possibility for men and women uh, to divorce. So this is means that uh, this is not for a contract for life. This is a contract. We contract with the uh, 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 you know each part is um, is. Uh, has to fulfill uh, the, 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 the engagement of responsibility, of duty. And if there is a conflict, if there is a shikaq, they have to be separated. Uh, but uh, they have not to, f to forget the fadl, you know, but because the Quran say, uh, so it's the, the separation, but 
uh, also kindly and uh, so it's opened the door it's silence sometimes it's silence sometimes opens the door and sometimes uh, uh, tell us what we have to do but i don't think that it's a contact for life uh, Marty. Marty John. Uh, yes, yourself. yes. Okay. I just want to say quickly to this point and then the other question about the four domains. So yeah. uh, definitely uh, the silence also, as we know, says something. And regarding to whether uh, this part about marriage, uh, I want to remind you of a verse that uh, my colleague Amira Abu Talib last time really focused on. Uh, so the idea is that you know, it as that Mary, uh, the, the text assumes might there might be problem at some point this bond might be severed but when you're staying together staying together with what is commonly known to be good you know which implies this idea of again organic understanding of what is ethical what is right depending on different contexts and needs and but and if there's a problem Ihsan, which is uh, last webinar uh, addressed that in detail. The thing of uh, which beauty and goodness, the thing about four domains, I, I want to tell the, the person, the colleague who asked this question, what we are arguing is that understanding of, uh, of marriage is lacking. This idea that it's a foundation, mm -hmm. you start with that we are all created from nafsin wahida. We have equal worth, right? And then that marriage is mithaq and that, that it has pillars. Think of it as a visually foundations. The pillars are mawad the second wa rahma. You know, these are the, the columns of the house, this ethical house. And that is a sign of the beauty of God, that it's an area. And then when you deal with different aspects of the of marriage, whether it's uh, uh, financial issues, whether it's divorce, whether it's parenting, hone in on these specific ethical directives that we've been talking about. Adl, af, fadl, these are key. So what, and this links to the question of activism. So we would like uh, for activists, if we can promote that kind of understanding of the marriage, I think that perhaps uh, opens the space. Yeah. Yes, Omena, and we have to end after this. Yes, yes, go on. Yes, I just want to go back to the idea of interpretation uh, and tafsir tradition. Uh, I just want to remind um, the, the audience and our listeners that the, the classical exegetes themselves, beginning from the 10th century, differed with each other all the time in, in meanings of, of, of verses, and they would introduce new meanings. Um, a, a, a famous exegete like uh, Al-Razi specifically has a quotation, beautiful quotation, where he says that uh, it's okay for latter exegetes to deduce new meanings from an area, from a verse that the older exegetes didn't see and didn't understand. So we're just doing the same thing. We're in that tradition, e even if we look at the verse now, because you get that question. On, well, there are 14 centuries of people understanding this verse one way, and now you're going to. And so, why not? If it's if it's a process towards the towards the ultimate justice and ultimate perfection of meaning, why not? The exegetes themselves, classical male exegetes themselves, said that said that it is possible to to have new meanings from the verse, better and more perfect meanings of the verses as we go along and may God help us then, inshallah. I just wanted to say that very quickly. Thank you. Thank you. And unfortunately, we have to end here. By the way, there is also a question, a kind of critique of you. Why are you only referencing men in your work? Why? <laughs> so, uh, but I think you reference women and the fact that you don't reference men in Mufassirin because the tradition, is not there. And I hope, and I'm sure the next generation, when they write, they will reference women, because by now there is a literature. As my go on. Yes, but we, they, I, I'm sure that we, we are referencing uh, men because they are the problems with their tafers ah. here, <laughs> <laughs> mainly. <laughs> That is, uh, that is true. Thank you so much. I really, really am so grateful for this, for sharing all this. And let me just say what I, uh, I feel so good about it, because 
the two questions that has been asking at the center of Musawa's work and my life, myself personally, is that why, if Islam is just, why this justice is not reflected in laws? Why women are treated as second class, society, uh, second class citizen? This is in the text, in Tafasir, I'm not saying in the Quran, in the text, in the literature, in what we know as authoritative knowledge or produced by men. And secondly, is that how we can really uh, recover, we can have equality and justice in our own time. So that is a search that we are all doing. And the Quran is so important because that is the most important source of authority. And that is why women always, uh, you know, tafsir is important and women engage with the Quran. And what you are doing here, to me is one thing, one thing that it is now you're part of it is this ethical turn. Now we see that everybody talks about ethics. And now many Muslims see Quran as a book of guidance, ethics, not as a book of law. And that is actually a change. A change which I see it as going back to the very beginning because for the first generation of Muslims, they did not consider Quran a book of law. They did not consider Sharia strict law, but as ethics. And what it tells us what is right, what is Shari. So that we are going back. But by the time that uh, fair schools emerged and, and within the historical context and power and everything, law became important. And now with the nation state has the monopoly of law, we are now thinking, we are all rethinking. But what you are doing that all those who have been working on ethics and Muslim male reformists have not done is actually introducing gender as a category of analysis. As Amina Vadud says, as a category of thought. And that is important. And what you are doing, what all of us are doing, we are recovering the voice of wo uh, women that were silenced. We are again inscribing, inscribing them in the production of authoritative religious knowledge. This authoritative religious knowledge must also reflect the women voices of women, the voices of disadvantage, the voice of disabled, the voice of those who have been silenced, not only the voice of elite who have been, had the privilege to interpret. So this is amazingly important. And I want to end here and hand it over to my um, colleague, Sarah. And this is immensely important. And we gave more time to this webinar than any other because of its important uh, its importance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Siba. We'll now launch a quick survey. Uh, if my colleague Hichama can please launch it now. And if you could just answer these two short questions so that we can better understand how you experience this webinar and take, in, take it into account for our future webinars. And while you're responding to the survey, I just want to thank again Asma Umeima Mulkiziba for this extremely captivating conversation. You will see in the chat and also in Facebook, we received a lot of uh, very uh, inspiring feedback and comments, people thanking you for this Jumu'a Mubaraka uh, and, and, and thanking you for your research. But also thank you for just the, the work you've been doing this past decades, which really has been so critical to many of us and helped us in reconciling our internal conflicts and transforming our approach to Quran and our faith. And I want to thank our audience for your constructive and valuable questions. We hope the webinar offered some perspectives and insight that will feed into your activism. And if you enjoyed the webinar, there will be more coming up in the next couple of weeks, inshallah. I hope you will be able to join us. So please check our website and follow our media page for a uh, social media page for more information. And I would like to thank the amazing team that is supporting us in organizing this webinar, my colleagues uh, Zuleha and Hishama, and also uh, my other colleagues in Musawa's Secretariat. And the recording is available on Musawa's Facebook uh, right now, and it will be in our YouTube channel, uh, inshallah, in the coming week. Thank you again. <laughs>